As his ministry continued, Jesus of Nazareth increasingly offended those in power. In standing up for sinners, he stood against the blind arrogance of religious leaders. In calling social rejects to follow him, he called out the sins of those who thought they had checked all the right boxes. And as he welcomed people who acknowledged their own sickness, he rejected those who believed they were healthy. Join us as we turn to the Gospel of Luke and see the great opposition that Jesus faced. As you discover the truth of the real Jesus, you'll find the source of your own story's significance. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today, whether online or here at our Frisco campus. And one thing I learned after the last service, you need to be careful what you sing for. That last song we sang, Make Room, I love the chorus. It says, shake up the ground of all my tradition, break down the walls of all my religion. It's easy for us to sing that, but it's really painful and it can really hurt a little bit if that actually is something that God does in your life and you're open to it. And quite frankly, that's exactly what Jesus is trying to do in the text that we're gonna be reading today and looking into. But before we go there, I just wanna ask you a question. Have you ever hosted a dinner party for some important guest or maybe even a, a family holiday when you had really high expectations? It would be a delightful gathering. There would be luscious food and drink. Uh, wonderful con conversations will stimulate everyone. Uh, perhaps new friendships, friendships will be made. Uh, family bonds will be strengthened. And everything is just gonna be exactly like you hoped it would be. But then during the dinner, someone breaks the universal taboo that politics, religion, and sex should not be talked about in polite company, much less an exquisite dinner party. Because we know at just the sound of a few words, eyebrows raise, forks drop, and throats can clear in unison, and the tension can get so thick you can cut it with a butter knife. Now, as usually is the case, anyone who has the gumption to interrupt a perfectly fine dinner with their verbal flatulence, and I mean verbal flatulence, doesn't drop the issue and move on. Oh no, if one person responds, their repartee is on. With each parry and rye post, another combatant joins the fray, and before long, the conversation level elevates to full on crazy, like this. Maybe you've been in a dinner party like that. Spouses are hiding under the table, kids are yelling food fight, and you the host in one last attempt to salvage the evening, shout above the tumult, desert anyone? And you are there the host of a dinner party gone wrong. Well, Luke in chapter 11 verses 37 through 54 records a dinner party gone wrong, a Pharisee one of the religious leaders in Jesus' day uh, invites Jesus over to what he is hoping will be a lovely dinner that might include a toast. But evidently, Jesus thought he said roast. And that's exactly what Jesus does during the dinner. So before we take a look at the interaction between Jesus and the others at this party, let me walk you through a quick guide to understanding a first century Jewish dinner party. Now, the first thing you need to know is who are the guests? And there are two particular types of guests along with Jesus. There are the Pharisees and the scribes along with Jesus. No other disciples are mentioned, however. Now, the Pharisees were an influential Jewish sect they were more blue collar from their background, but they were highly devout. They believed not only in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, but also the oral law, which had been developed through the years, which was their way of trying to 
understand all the implications of the big laws, the 613 laws in the Torah. And so they would spin it out and parse it out to try to think of any contingency that might happen. Now as well, they believed in life after death. They believed there was a resurrection and the spiritual reality, they believed that angels were real. Now, even though they weren't there, I think it's important for you to know about the Sadducees. They were probably the more authoritative and powerful Jewish sect, and they had different beliefs. They believed in the Torah only, the first five books of the Old Testament and the prophets. They did not believe there was any life after death. They did not believe in a spiritual realm, and angels did not exist, and they were from the uh, the wealthy elite families of Israel. And now, then there were also this group called the scribes. A better way to understand them is that they were religious lawyers. So if you think lawyers in our day might could get possibly worse, just add religion to it, and that's kind of what you get, all right? So here's the deal. They were the guardians of the biblical text, they meticulously copied. They actually knew how many words should go in every line and how many rows should be in it. I mean, they had it down to a T. But more than that, they were also the official ones who would determine what a law made. And they actually started building case law, much like our Supreme Court in the United States. And they would go back and they would adjudicate on all the fine points of the religious teachings. All right, that's who was there. Now, another thing you need to know is, is that etiquette at a dinner party in Israel is a pretty big deal. That when you invite someone to join you at table, you are by that invitation inviting them to friendship. And there is just this unspoken commitment to honor each other and to work for each other's well-being. And not only is this a big deal, but also this whole idea of ritual purity is running in the background of this party. Now, ritual purity is not necessarily moral, but it is ceremonial, but deeply religious. That is, if you were ceremonially unclean, you were deemed unfit to be in the presence of God. You could not go into the temple. You could not participate in temple worship. Now, there were three primary ways that you could be defiled, is the word that they used, and be unclean. It would be by touching a dead body or touching or walking on a grave. It could be the expression of some bodily fluid. So ladies, during your monthly period, you would be unclean for seven days and not welcome in the court of women at the temple. Uh, and then the third way is this. If you had a skin disease or any other bodily imperfection, if you were deaf, blind, missing a limb, any other bodily defect, you were declared unclean and you were not welcome to participate in the temple and the religion of the day. And even though it was not necessarily moral, it had incredible impact on the people who were deemed unfit to be in the presence of God. Now that's kind of the things running in the background. And as this story opens up in verse 37, Jesus clearly loves to stir things up. Now look at verses 37 through 38. As Jesus was speaking, one of the Pharisees invited him home for a meal. So he went in and took his place at the table. His host was amazed to see that he sat down to eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony required by Jewish custom. So it was the custom that when you sat down at a table, you would wash your hands. It wasn't a hygiene issue. It was a ritual issue of ritual cleanness. Now, why does Jesus do this? Well, if Jesus understands if you want some people to see a new way, you have to start by stirring up the old way. We know now, and I think Jesus, because of who he was, certainly knew this, that between the ages of 25 and 35, most people's religious thinking and values get cemented in. They get settled. 
And Jesus understood that these religious leaders, if they were going to have a heart that would be open and allow them to come into the kingdom with him, he had to disrupt their thinking. And so Jesus does what I would like to call a premeditated performance art piece. That is, that he intentionally doesn't wash his hands to give off a signal that things are going to be different at this dinner. Now, here's the thing. I don't think Jesus is trying to be rude. I don't think he's trying to get back at the Pharisees. I don't think he's just trying to be a pill, and he's not trying to be a Karen. I mean, he has a reason for doing this. Okay, I'm sorry. If your name is Karen, I probably have already offended you. And I, I'm sorry about that. And I just want everyone to know that as I go through this message, probably every one of you are going to be offended at some point. So if you feel the need to write an email, I want to go ahead and give you the address. It's complaints at Jesus.com. And if you'll just address any complaint you have, that is the email address. All right. Now, here's the deal. Jesus stirs things up because he wants to disrupt their thinking. And he stirs things up by calling out their hypocrisy. Now, the word hypocrisy in English comes from the Greek word hypocrisis, which means to play a part. It's a word that comes from theater. It's like putting on a mask. It is pretending to be someone that you are not. And if I could just kind of uh, synthesize all the wonderful definitions about hypocrisy, I would synthesize it down to this one. Hypocrisy is pretending to be something that in fact you are not. We often say, you know, this person doesn't practice what they preach. There is something endemic in hypocrisy that we are covering up something. We're trying to appear to be someone or be somebody or believe something that in fact we really do not. And there are different shades and nuances of the meaning of hypocrisy. And quite frankly, in the verses we're going to look at, Jesus gets to about all of them. So let's take a look at Jesus' dire warnings against hypocrisy. Now, depending on what particular translation you have, these may be listed as woes. In the New Living Translation, which I'll be using, uh, Jesus is translated as saying, Oh, what sorrows await you if you do these things. He is saying it is not going to go well with you if you live out these expressions of hypocrisy. So with that in mind, you ready? Let's dig in a bit. Here's the first expression of hypocrisy. Jesus is saying hypocrisy is pretending to, oh, no, I'm sorry, hypocrisy is spending most of your time managing your image, and very little forming your character. Hypocrisy is focusing more on managing your image than really developing your character. Here's what he says in verses 39 through 41. Then the Lord said to him, you Pharisees are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy full of greed and wickedness. Fools, didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? So clean the inside by giving gifts to the poor and you will be clean all over. What he's saying is you focus on the external, the appearances of your life, your image, but you need to be doing more that creates cleanliness on the inside. And he uses just giving alms to the poor as an example of that. Uh, John Ortberg in several of his books was the first one that kind of brought to light this understanding in my mind in this little phrase, image management. And one particular occasion, he is talking about the fact that he came to the realization that he was being more measured and calculating about how he was being perceived by people and how he was working subtly, though yet very hard, to impact the way they were seeing him. And he said, I began to realize I was very um, subconsciously and consciously managing my image. Now, uh, that's what John Ortberg says, and that's what Jesus is getting onto the Pharisees about. Now, here's the deal. We do the same thing with language. 
We're careful not to use four-letter words that begin with F or S or A and D. But we're more than happy to express our contempt or slander about other people or to other people using non-offensive language like you moron or you loser or you idiot or you jerk. We can become the kings and the queens of gossip simply by couching what we say in the form of a prayer request, right? We all told dozens of lies, white lies, about why we were late to work or how the dog ate our homework, all in an effort to manage our image in the way people see us. Hey, in social media, oh my gosh, it is a breeding ground for hypocrisy because on social media, you can post your best and hide the rest. You can create an image of a happy family, of a, of, of a stable and loving marriage, and that you're a budding saint by the things that you post there. But the true story might be that your marriage is imploding and your kids are out of control and your heart is dark. That is, it is easy to be something online that in fact you are not, but it's your appearance. So, And here's what Jesus is getting at when he says, hey, look, focus on the inside. What he wants us to know is this, is it focusing on shaping your character? When you do that, then you don't have to worry about managing your image, right? If you're not telling white lies all the time, if you're not offending people, if you are really focusing on developing your character like Jesus, you don't have to worry about your image anymore because you are pleasing the audience of one. All right, that's the first one. Here's the second one. Hypocrisy is majoring on minor things and minoring on major things. Look at what Jesus says in verse 42. What sorrow awaits you, Pharisees, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens but you ignore justice and the love of God. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Now, listen, there is a long history in Christian history about believers focusing on the minor things and totally neglect. Did you say that again? I'm sorry, Siri. that's my Siri watch going off. <laughs> sorry, could you say that again? Okay, let me say that again. <laughs> Last hour, the alarm went off and said, your heart rate is elevated, but you're not appearing to move very much. Are you okay? <laughs> and so while I was preaching, I had to click on, I'm okay. <laughs> so clearly there's a setting I need to work on. So where in the heck was I? Okay. All right. There's a long history of us focusing on minor things as opposed to major things. Because it's just easy, you know? Growing up, my history was, if you're, you're a good Baptist, you don't smoke, drink, cuss, or chew, or go with the girls who do. It's a lot easier to do that <laughs> than love God with your whole heart above all other things and to work for justice. That's hard. But, you know, it's relatively easy, you know, not to do some of those things. And I even took some of that with me to Baylor. So uh, when I was a freshman at Baylor... I went to uh, eat at a place called George's. Anybody ever been to George's in Waco? A number of you have. They're known for their chicken fried steak and their beer that is sold, that is sold in a big old uh, goblet. And they are really cool. They're really large. And a lot of us wanted to have those to put up on the bookshelves in our dorm room to kind of decorate. So I go out to a group of friends one night and I don't... I, I don't order a beer because I'm Baptist, right? And, but I'm there, but one of the guys left his big old glass empty there, so I stuck it under my coat and took it out and stole it and put it in my dorm room. Y'all, it took me several years to understand the irony of that. I was okay with stealing the big old glass, just not drinking the beer. How messed up is that? I mean, the stealing is like one of the big 10. <laughs> so after the last service, this guy, a friend of mine named Aaron came back and said, hey, do you still have the big old glass? <laughs> Robin, do we still have it? It's, we do, I still have the big old glass. <laughs> do I wanna make a commitment to pull it out of the attic and, and take it back? Okay, maybe I'll do that. But you see what I'm saying? We, we get this all wrong. Here's the thing. All right, now I'm gonna, I wanna meddle. 
because of a, a milestone that was passed. Have you been more emotionally jacked up because you were required to wear a mask for a while? More than you are that a million people died of COVID. And today, 250,000 kids wake up every day missing at least one parent. What jacks you up? Is it a minor thing? Or do you get jacked up by the major things? All right, complaints at Jesus.com. Right there. Here we go. Hypocrisy is practicing your religion solely for your self-interest. Look at verses 43 through 44. What sorrow awaits you, Pharisees, for you love to sit in the seats of honor in the synagogues and receive respectful greetings as you walk in the marketplaces. Yes, what sorrow awaits for you. You get two sorrows for this one. You know, for loving the adulation, you know, because you are a, a religious person. For you are like hidden graves in a field. People walk over them without knowing the corruption they're stepping on. That is, they are defiled. All right. Now, you see, in some settings, like here in the Bible Belt, being seen as a church-going Christian is still an asset, especially when it comes to business and politics. The sad thing is, is that when we are held up on a pedestal for our religious behavior, the door to becoming judgmental opens really widely. And most believers, many of us are very excited about the opportunity to judge everybody for everything that they do wrong. Quite frankly, even if they're not even a believer, we expect them to act like that and we judge them because they are not. And what Jesus wants these Pharisees to know and us to know is that hypocritical religion contaminates others. Jesus said the Pharisees were like hidden graves. They were appearing to be religious, but inside they were dead. And when people came into contact with them, they were contaminated. Do you know that today 85% of millennials outside the faith think that Christianity is hypocritical? Just the, how many of you are in the millennial generation? Raise your hand. I just like to, all right, don't be bashful. We love millennials here. Okay, there you go. Do you know that surveys say that actually 50% of millennials who are involved in church believe that Christianity is hypocritical? You see, what Jesus is saying is that when we are hypocritical, it defiles other people who are outside the faith, faith and they become cynical about Christianity and they no longer trust or are open to faith. And that's why Jesus is saying, oh, what sorrows come to you because you are a hypocrite in this way. He goes on, it gets better. Hypo hypocrisy is placing high religious expectations on others without bearing any responsibility to help them. In Luke 11, verses 45 and through 46, we read, Teacher, said an expert in religious law. Here's one of the scribes. You've insulted us too in what you just said. Jesus said, hey, I've got some stuff for you too. Here it is. And he says, what sorrow also awaits you experts in religious law. For you crush people with unbearable religious demands. You keep parsing out all the ways that you can break the law and all the ways that you can disappoint God and you never lift a finger to ease the burden. Now, in my college days, I was still, a, hopefully, a maturing believer, and I was still learning, and I was invited to Bill Gothard's Institute for Basic Youth Conflicts. Don't know if you ever went. But I went the first night, and I didn't return after, because when you went, he gave you a notebook that was this thick that outlined all the possible ways that you could mess up or the things that you need to do. And even then in my young head, I was going, didn't Jesus boil all the law and prophets down into this one little phrase and two sentences? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. I was going, I don't, I don't need that whole big book. Now, we all get this. We all get the fact that we, can, we love for people to spell it out and we don't have any ambiguity about what I'm supposed to do or not to do. But, but when we're guilty of weighing people down religiously and not helping, that's hypocritical. 
Here's a thought that came to me this week. Many of us, uh, as followers of Jesus, are really delighted that Roe v. Wade has been overturned or will be overturned by the Supreme Court. Now, it doesn't really overturn it. It just says it's not a constitutional right and it sends the decision back to state legislators. But it's a huge victory, many people think. And so now what's gonna happen, uh, many followers of Jesus think, is that now a woman who becomes pregnant, even in poverty, uh, sometimes because of incest or rape, now, now they're gonna be forced because of government intervention into carrying those pregnancies that involve a real person into full term. And I understand that many Christians are, are very delighted by that fact. But here's one thing that many people in the pro-life movement seem to miss. Is that while we want the government to intervene on taking those pregnancies to full term, when it comes to providing the right kind of health care and the support for those women and to give them the opportunity to move through that, no, 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 don't want to do that. You know, many Christians aren't really pro-life. They're pro-fetal life. And the world notices our hypocrisy. I personally am pro all of life. And I think Jesus is pro all of life. Here's another one. Wait, complaints at <laughs> Jesus.com. <laughs> hypocrisy is judging other people's sins while ignoring your own. What sorrow waits you for you build monuments for the prophets? Your own ancestors killed long ago, but in fact, you stand as witnesses who agree with what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets and you join in their crime by building the monuments. This is what God in his wisdom has said about you. Now he's talking to the Pharisees and the scribes at the table. I will send prophets and apostles to them, but they will kill some and persecute the others. Now this is a little hard to understand, but here's what Jesus is saying. The Pharisees are trying to distance themselves from the sins of their ancestors by building monuments to the prophets their ancestors killed. But Jesus recognizes our human tendency to try so hard to be different from our ancestors that we try so hard that in fact, we end up doing the very same thing that our ancestors did. And that's what Jesus is saying about them. So here's what Jesus is saying. The sins that you rail against, the sins that you rail against in others may, not always, but may be a clue to the sins that lie in you. Now, think with me for a moment. Have you ever noticed how many TV preachers rail against sexual immorality and pornography and adultery, and yet how many of them get caught doing one of those things? You see, we tend to preach against and rail against the things that we struggle with. And so let me ask you, when you hear and see someone really getting upset about people who don't tell the truth and people who tell all the white lies and it really gets under your skin, quite possibly it's because that's why you struggle and where you struggle too. Or maybe you see people who are so inwardly focused, they're very selfish with all their wealth and their stuff, they're stingy people, and you just really get bent out of shape when you see how unconcerned they are, and yet that what that might be telling you is that you're not as generous and open-handed as you should be. And when you get upset because people are saying racist things about white people and they talk about white supremacy and stuff, if that really gets under your skin, the reason might be is because deep inside, you're dealing with racism yourself. And here's another one. Man, if you're a Christian and man, seeing someone be a hypocrite gets all over you, <laughs> guess what? You may be a hypocrite, all right? One of your blind spots, right? Now, here's the last thing Jesus says. Hypocrisy has devastating effects. In verse 52, what sorrow awaits you experts in religious law, for you remove the key to knowledge from the people. You don't enter into the kingdom yourselves, and you prevent others from 
entering. Now here's what he's saying. Hypocrisy, scribes, Pharisees, keeps you from entering into the full life of of God under his gracious reign. And you can pretend it's something so long that after a while you can believe that it's true. But thinking that it's true and acting as if it's true when it's really not doesn't make it true in your life. You can do a lot of religious stuff. You can use a lot of religious language. But if it does not get into your heart and transform you, you're not truly living under God's gracious reign. You are not in his kingdom. Also, Jesus says, hypocrisy also keeps others from entering a full life under God's gracious reign. Now, here's what he is saying. He's saying, scribes, your approach to the law, which was intended to lead people to God, your approach to interpreting the law, the way you, in fact, interpret the law in some cases, and the way you communicate that is actually keeping people away. You are pushing them away. And oh, what sorrow awaits you if your approach to the law and the way you interpret it and the way you communicate it pushes people away, it is not going to go well for you. And I think that history in Christianity is very full of the way that we have handled and mishandled Scripture. And on the basis of the way we handled it, we've affirmed slavery and segregation and the diminishment of women. And no matter how you fall on the LGBTQ thing, the way we have handled it, we have been the culprits when it comes to how often many people who are gay and lesbian and transgender feel judged and unfit and unworthy. And we are pushing people away. And Jesus says, what sorrow awaits you? Now, what do you do with a message like this? I'm only kidding about emailing Jesus, okay? Well, what happened to Jesus as he was leaving? The teachers and the scribes, they got really ticked and they started trying to provoke him in a way to capture him. Others of you may feel a little bit, well, like they used to say in those early Baptist churches I used to preach, preacher, you, you stepped on my toes. In fact, I talked to Paul about this earlier when I was pastor at First Baptist Church in Troy and Bell Falls. You know, I was standing at the back of the auditorium when the service was over and people would walk through and they'd shake my hand and look at me and go, well, preacher, you really stepped on my toes today. And here's the deal. They weren't mad at me. In fact, they were glad. They were glad because they realized that they needed to be confronted by some of their attitudes and their perspectives in their ways of following Jesus. So, if I stepped on your toes today, I wanna to offer two words, a word of comfort and a word of challenge today. The first is a word of comfort. The opposite of hypocrisy is authenticity. And so, if you are a follower of Jesus who struggles with sins and doubts along the way, you're normal. You're not a hypocrite. It's a journey of growing to be like Jesus. Three steps forward, two steps back. Take a time out, get back involved. That's normal. So I hope I give you some relief today. But a word of challenge, especially to those of you who have grown up in church, who are highly churched, or thoroughly convinced of your rightness, I wanna speak a word of challenge. I wanna challenge you to stop looking out the window at others for a moment and take a good look at yourself in the mirror. Honestly, have you been putting way more effort into managing your image? than in learning to grow and to become like Jesus? Truthfully, have you been majoring on the minors 
and you've totally ignored the major things of the gospel, like justice, the love of God, and the love of your neighbor. Honestly, have you been holding people up to rigid religious expectations and you haven't lifted a finger to come alongside them, to help them, to show them the spirit that can transform them? Have you been fooling yourself and you're really not in the kingdom? Maybe you are, but if you're really honest, the quality of your life has been pushing people away rather than drawing them to Jesus. If that's you, I wanna make one more challenge. I wanna pray for you. And because at the heart of hypocrisy is the desire to cover things up and to keep them hidden, I want to ask you in this moment, if you said yes to any of those things, managing your image, majoring on the minors, and you're coming to see that there is more hypocrisy in you than you ever thought possible, and you would like for me to pray for you and me, would you raise your hand and be authentic and say, this is who I am. Father, I wanna thank you for the courage of these men and women today who have said, as I listen to the words of Jesus and his principles that I recognize that I have been at times more like the Pharisees and the scribes than like him. And Father, I pray that in this moment, your Holy Spirit will flow into our lives, renew our minds, renew our spirits, form us more into the likeness of Jesus. And as you do, we recognize that it will not be sorrow that awaits us, but that it will be gladness that awaits us because we live the kind of life that draws people to you. Oh God, may that be true in my life. May it be true in our life together. And all God's people said together in Jesus' name, amen, amen.